Welcome back to the next episode of What's Up Prof. Hello again, Walter. Good day. We said we were going to talk about this issue, right? Yes. Well, it's very relevant, very current, so we have to get into it. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us again together. We ask that you please bless the discussion, bless the viewers, and also help us to discern the things that is happening in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, we have a new encyclical out. And uh, we mentioned it in the last episode. And I think we just have to briefly go through it and see what this is all about. Because uh, deception is the name of the game, isn't it? Yes. In the world. And we're going to expose the master deceiver today. We are going to try. It's not an easy task because he's, he's very good at what he does. Exactly. So this is uh, Pope Francis's latest encyclical. And this comes from the Vatican webpage. Encyclical letter, Fratelli Tutti, of the Holy Father Francis on Fraternity and Social Friendship. In actual fact, this is uh, a document on Catholic social doctrine, mm. but it's very well disguised, very well disguised. So let us jump right into it. Here is an article in Crooks that just appeared, and it comes from October 6, 2020, where Bishop Michael Cerny gives his opinion on this encyclical. It's titled, Cardinal Says Pope's New Encyclical is a Warning. The World is on the Brink. So this is almost like climate change, you yeah, know. Yeah. Everything's on the brink. Everything yes. has to change right now. There's a deadline. There's a deadline. One of Pope Francis's top advisors said that the pontiff sees the current world situation comparable to that of the Cuban Missile Crisis, World War II or 9-11, and that to fully understand the papal encyclical released on Sunday, it's necessary to acknowledge we're on the brink. So this is, this is a, a common trend in what we're doing today what's happening in the world. Depending on your age, what was it like to hear Pius XII deliver his Christmas messages during World War II, said Cardinal Michael Cerny on Monday? Or how did it feel when Pope John XXIII published Passem in Teres? Or after 2007-2008 crisis? It's interesting how they mention these events, right? Yeah. Or after 9-11? And I think you need to recover that feeling in your stomach and your whole being to appreciate Fratelli Tutti. Okay, oh. he continues. I think Pope Francis feels today the world needs a message comparable to what we needed during the Cuban Missile Crisis or World War II, 9-11, or the big crash of 2000. 7, 2008. Now it's interesting that we said in the past that this crash was very important because it changed the world economy. Correct. It totally changed the world economy. And that's important because it actually brought the world economy closer to the papal system. Yes. It just needs tweaking now. He said we're on the brink. We need to pull back in a very human, worldwide, and local way. And I think that's one way to get into Fratelli Tutti. This gives a very good background of uh, the setting for this encyclical. Mm. According to the Cardinal, if Pope Francis's previous encyclical, Laudato Si, on the care of creation, taught us that everything is connected, Fratelli Tutti teaches us that everyone is mm. connected. So we're moving from the environment, environmental, global issues to the human issues. 
If we take responsibility for our common home and for our brothers and sisters, then I think that we do have a good chance and my hope is rekindled and inspired to keep on going and do more, he said. We're on an express train. Yes. Sonny argued that it's not the role of church leaders, not even the Pope, to tell us how to run our economy and or our politics. However, uh, that's the important word, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Pope can guide the world towards certain values, and this is what the Pope does in his latest encyclical, issuing a reminder that the economy cannot be in the driver's seat of politics. So he's going to give the moral directive as to where we are going with this thing. Now, I actually read the encyclical, mm -hmm. and uh, I think we should just read a few things. We're not going to go through the entire encyclical. It would take us a very long time. But just a few highlights. Before we continue with this encyclical, I have to say that it's written in a very flowery language. Mm -hmm. But hidden in that language, there are certain points which become very important for the world we are living in. Yeah. And it has a much deeper root mm. than appears yes, on, the, on, the, on the first look. So this is the encyclical, and we will scroll down through the encyclical. And he starts with... Fratelli Tutti, with these words, so St. Francis of Assisi addressed his brothers and sisters and proposed to them a way of life marked by the flavor of the gospel. Of the counsels Francis offered, I would like to select the one in which he calls for a love that transcends the barriers of geography and distance and declares, blessed all those who love their brother as much as when he is far away from him as when he is with him. So he starts with this. So his role model mm. is St. Francis of Assisi. Now, I have a problem with that from the word go, because my role model is Jesus Christ. Yes. And that would be the starting point where I would start. But for... A Roman Catholic, I guess the saint mm. is a is a better interpreter. Yeah, but it's also because they put them on par with Jesus. Correct. So now, let's just read some of the statements. We're not going to read too many, just a few of them. Mm. Point number two, he says, This saint of fraternal love, simplicity and joy, who inspired me to write the encyclical Laudato Si. So he refers mm -hmm. back to Laudato Si. You cannot separate the two. Mm -hmm. So the one deals with the environment, the other one deals yes. with humanity. And the two have to go together. Prompts me once more to devote this new encyclical to fraternity and social friendship. Francis felt himself a brother to the sun, mm -hmm. the sea, and the wind. Yet he knew that he was even closer to those of his own flesh. Now, my young brother, what is that? Pantheism. Pantheism. Mm -hmm. At his best. Was Laudato Si speckled with pantheism? Yes. This is a pantheistic religion. Mm. It is an earthbound pantheistic religion where man sets himself up as his own deity. This is a very dangerous dangerous opening statement. Mm -hmm. Wherever he went, he sowed seeds of peace and walked alongside the poor, the abandoned, the infirm and the outcast, the least of his brothers and sisters. Now this sets the tone for Catholic social mm -hmm. doctrine. Christ came to save all. Yes. 
of humanity. And Jesus said, the poor will be with you always. And there are discrepancies in the world which are not fair. Mm -hmm. But the way in which they use the situation, which they often create themselves, mm -hmm. is what is scary. And then he starts off by talking about without borders. Mm -hmm. No borders. Now we don't have to go into great detail. We know that Donald Trump was very strict on borders and that there was a problem there with borders. So he goes into this, he even talks about walls and, and all yeah. of these issues. He says, Francis did not wage a war of words aimed at imposing doctrines. He simply spread the love of God. He understood that God is love and those who abide in love abide in God. Quoting 1 John 4, 16. In this way he became a father to all and inspired the vision of a fraternal society. Now, the problem with this sentence is that this is how many people believe today. All you need is to preach about the love of Jesus nothing else, mm -hmm. or maybe just love, and leave out Jesus. Jesus. Yes. And that doctrines are a problem. Mm -hmm. That's why Francis did not wage a war of words aimed at imposing doctrines. Because it causes division. It causes division. And F Pope Francis said, take away the doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't want doctrine. They want their social theology. Now, their social theology will only work, of course, if there are enough poor people that they can get on board. So the poorer they can make society, the more likely they are to succeed in getting the power that they want. Yes. This is a very dangerous precedent. Now, uh, again, he refers to Laudato Si. In the preparation of Laudato Si, I had a source of inspiration in my brother Bartholomew, the Orthodox Patriarch, and he says he had um, this grand imam, Ahmad mm -hmm. al-Tayyib. He was also a source of inspiration. We met in Abu Dhabi. And the present encyclical takes up and develops some of the great themes raised in the document that the imam and he signed together. Mm -hmm. So this is all being prepared beforehand. Yes. And the mega religions of the world seem to be on board. Yes, right. that's uh, Muslim. Have you ever been to the Middle East? Have you ever mm. been to these countries in the Middle East? No. Well, there you have a massive divide between the rich and the poor. So it is a, it is a very fertile ground for uh, Catholic social, social doctrine. doctrine. Yes. So as would be poorer countries, yeah. third world third countries, world. whether they be in Africa, mm -hmm. whether they be in South America, the target is Protestant countries mm. that have developed a form of affluence which is not compatible with the rest of the world. And that has to be brought down because that is the way in which you control humanity, right? Now, if you understand this, then uh, you will see where they're actually heading. Of course, he has to bring in the COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic and the reasons why we need rapid change. Anyone who thinks that the only lesson to be learned was the need to improve what we were already doing or to refine existing systems and regulations is denying reality. We need change. change. The new normal. Yeah. The Great Reset. We have to go to the Great Reset. It's interesting, he doesn't mention any specific legislation. He doesn't tout Sunday or mm -hmm. any one of mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. He did that before. Yes, he's just emphasizing the doubt to see. And that's been done there already. It's so been done, so we don't have to go there. So if we continue, and... Here he has, again, this theme. Let us dream them as a single human family. This is a, a globalist agenda. This is a one world government agenda. This is the papal agenda. 
How much of the world does he want to control? The whole world. The whole world. How much of the world must fall in with his philosophy? Well, everybody. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, if we take the Trump campaign and we take the Biden campaign, which one is more in line with the new world order idea? Biden, Biden campaign. The Biden camp, right? Uh, that, that's becoming very interesting to me. Because as we discussed last time, you know, there are King of the North elements in both yeah. of them. And both of them stand for Catholicism, and uh, yeah. as we dealt with in, in the last discussion. But this Pope and the papacy in general dreams of world dominance. Yes. World dominance. A one world, world order. And the Donald Trump philosophy, although church and state is very strong in that philosophy, which is part of the Roman philosophy, it's not very strong on the one world government yeah, no, philosophy. It's more nationalist. So dark clouds over a closed world, shattered dreams, and it continues on that issue. And he says, ancient conflicts thought long buried are breaking out anew, while instances of myopic, extremist, resentful, and aggressive nationalism are on the rise. Who's he referring to? Trump. Trump. Mm -hmm. In some countries, the concept of popular and national unity, influenced by various ideologies, is creating new forms of selfishness and a loss of social sense and the guise of defending national mm. interests. So obviously we have this clash, right? Yeah. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. What's interesting with this clash as well is a lot of people see Trump as the hero because he's going to get rid of this new world order. For, uh, but here he is touting it. The yes. Pope is touting it. If you take the QAnon story, there are so many that are pinning their hopes. Social media has banned all Q and non mentions no, no. lately. Uh, they also stated, of course, that the present Pope will be removed and that uh, Ratzinger will again take over. But he's so old now. Yeah. I think this is all a pipe dream. There will be a synthesis somewhere along the right. line. So, yes, so they're working on this issue. Let's continue. He is very persistent that there seems to be a plan lacking for everyone. Mm. We need a global governance. And we don't have to go into the guys. He's talking about brotherly love and love for each other and love for our differences. Evangelism is totally out of the picture. Mm. We're all supposed to live side by side happily acknowledging that the other one is just as much in the truth as, as we are. Yes. But the gospel is totally different. Yes. The gospel says go and Go to disciples. every uh, tongue and nation and everything and make disciples. Make disciples. And this is totally out mm -hmm. in this new world order. He talks about the throwaway world. We don't have to read all of this in such flowery language. He talks about insufficiency of universal human rights and the rights of women and all the things, slavery, all of these issues. He mentions them. And conflict and fear of humanity and temptation to build a culture of walls. Now, where does that come from? Yeah, from Trump. It's Trump. He talks about walls, to raise walls, walls in the heart, walls on the land, in order to prevent this encounter with other cultures, with other people. He wants to integrate humanity into one mixture. Yeah, no borders. Maybe. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, who separated the cultures? Uh, God. Okay, did that mean that God wanted to isolate cultures? No. Obviously not, no. because you had to evangelize, yes. you had to get to know people. But God acknowledged that there were differences, and these differences must all disappear. I'm not against uh, <laughs> immigration or migration, no. if people have said, I'm just 
generally saying what the, what the will of the papacy is. So globalization and progress without a shared roadmap won't work. We need a shared roadmap. Mm. But we have to get to the, to the nitty gritty of this document. He says here, in today's world, the sense of belonging to a single human family is fading, and the dream of working together for justice and peace seems an outdated utopia. What reigns instead is a cool, comfortable and globalized indifference born of deep disillusionment, concealed behind a deceptive illusion, thinking that we are all powerful while failing to realize that we are all in the same boat. It sounds very good, right? Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, where is it going to lead? And he talks about pandemics and other calamities in history. True, a worldwide tragedy like the COVID-19 pandemic momentarily revived the sense that we are a real global community, all in the same boat, where one person's problems are the problems of all. Once more, we realize that no one is saved alone. We can only be saved together. Sure. That's interesting. Mm. Collective salvation. Is there such a thing in the Bible? No. No. You can only work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So what they're really talking about is getting rid of your individuality. Mm -hmm for the sake of the common, common good. good. Yeah. As I said in those days, the storm has exposed our vulnerability and uncovered those false and superfluous certainties around which we constructed our daily schedules, our projects, our habits, and our priorities. Amid this storm, the facade of those stereotypes with which we camouflaged our egos always worrying about appearances, has fallen away, revealing once more the inelutable and blessed awareness that we are part of one another, that we are brothers and sisters of one another. We are all one. Communism has everybody even wearing the same clothes. Mm, driving the same car. Driving the same car, everything is the same. Individuality is something that must be faded out. If you look at human appearances, are there two people that are alike, even twins? Are they absolutely the same? No. Nope. So is God a God of variety, or is God a God of singularity? Variety. Okay. You see, uh, they, they mix up the biblical oneness that Jesus talks about with their human... That's a very good point. Yes, that you that oneness is one in purpose, in terms of faith, mm -hmm. of where we come from, who saves us, and where we are going. Now we don't have to read all he has to say about all of these things. His point here, point thirty-five. All too quickly, however, we forget the lessons of history. The teacher of life once this health crisis passes, our worst response would be to plunge even more deeply into feverish consumerism and new forms of egotistic self-preservation. God willing, after all this, we will think no longer in terms of them and those, but only us. If only this may prove not to be just another tragedy of history from which we have learned nothing. This COVID is going to be used to the uttermost oh, yes. to achieve an objective. This new normal. This the new normal. An absence of human dignity on the borders. Certain populist political regimes, as well as certain liberal economic approaches, maintain that an influx of migrants is to pre prevent it at all costs. Who is he talking about again? Yeah. The United States. The United States. And any other country that refuses to take migrants. Yes. They had a big issue in Europe. A big one in, in Germany and yeah. all over the world. This is a major issue. But the Pope has always maintained mm. that we have to have migrants. We have to mix the cultures. 
Uh, I'm wondering whether he wants to mix cultures or whether he wants to mix religions. Mm. Because cultures come with, with religion. religions. Migration more than ever before will play a pivotal role in the future of our world. He's going to mix. He's going to mix. Definitely. Yet it is also true that an individual and a people are only fruitful and productive if they are able to develop a creative openness to others. We have to mix shameless aggression. This has now given free rein to ideologies, things that until a few years ago could not be said by anyone without risking the loss of universal respect can now be said with impunity and in the crudest of terms, even by some political figures. Who is he referring to? <laughs> it's getting boring, right? <laughs> it's a one-way conversation the whole time, it looks like, towards Trump. <laughs> yeah, it is definitely alluding to... He should have, he should have said that um, not only Francis of Assisi was inspiring to write this. Yes, absolutely. There's another one here. Article 46 here, we should also recognize that destructive forms of fanaticism are at times found amongst religious believers, including Christians. He likes to throw that in yeah. there. And what was his greatest gripe with Christians? The Christian funder? Fundamentalists, uh -huh. true Bible believers. True Bible oh. believers. Oh. And they define it. Anybody who believes in a literal creation, who believes that Jesus atoned for our sins, etc. Is it fundamentalist? Yes, who believes in a literal resurrection, yes. all of those issues. They are the enemy of the world. Yeah, they, they're terrorists. So including Christians, mm. they too can be caught up in networks of verbal violence, through the internet and various forums of digital communication. I wonder whether he's talking <coughs> about us. Even in Catholic media, limits can be overstepped. I think he's talking about... The church militant. The church militant. Defamation and slander can become commonplace and all ethical standards and respect for the good name of others can be abandoned. How can this contribute to the fraternity of our common father, asks us. But Jesus said, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Yeah. So the gospel will bring variance. He's cutting out the gospel. Mm. Very important. There's no room for the gospel in his fraternity. That's why Jesus Christ is not the norm. St. Francis yeah. becomes the norm. Information without wisdom, forms of subjection and self-contempt and hope and very flowery language. And then he, he discusses in great detail the Good Samaritan. But he totally misses the point of who the Good Samaritan is. The Good Samaritan is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And what did Jesus Christ do? when he came across this poor, battered man. He was on a journey. Mm. All the others that had passed by had come down from Jerusalem mm. and they ignored this man lying there. But uh, the Good Samaritan went up to him and gave him oil and wine and dressed his wounds with that. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Yes. The wine is the symbol of teaching, of doctrine. Yes, doctrine. So he gave him wine and he gave him doctrine mm. because the church had neglected mm -hmm. him. Come down. And then he put him on his own donkey, his own means of transport, and he took him to an inn, a very strange inn because it was also a hospital. It's a symbol of the church. Yeah. And then he said to the innkeeper, here is some money. It's interesting that he gave him two pence. Mm -hmm. 
two pence and said, I'm going away, but when I come again, I will reward you. But here's the money that is necessary to take care of these neglected ones in the hospital, the church. Now just for interest's sake, a penny was a day's wages. So he gave him two days' wages. I'll let the people think about that for themselves. Because in to cosmic weak thinking, a day <laughs> would be a thousand years. But let's not go there. We'll get into trouble. But it's an interesting, interesting thought. So he has this story about, uh, you know, this poor man and the good Samaritan. And he doesn't make Jesus the good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. We become the good Samaritans. So we're going to skip his long story on the good Samaritan where he talks about all of these issues. It's interesting that the imams and everybody was so interested in this encyclical. Mm. And then there's this interesting heading, Neighbors Without Borders. This is definitely globalism on a grand scale, envisaging and engendering an open world. Yeah. This is New World Order stuff, right? Again, he has a topic here, open societies that integrate everyone, inadequate understandings of universal love, a love capable of transcending borders, is the basis of what in every city and country can be called social friendship. Genuine social friendship within a society makes true universal openness possible. He's obviously referring to Catholic social doctrine. And we'll see, he gets to the point a little bit later in his encyclical. Now, what is the role of the church, according to the Pope? It's to promote moral values. Now, in his case, whose moral values? His own. His own, the churches, right? Not the biblical ones. No. So he writes, Nor can we fail to mention that seeking and pursuing the good of others and of the entire human family also implies helping individuals and societies to mature in the moral values that foster integral human development. Now those moral values come from the papacy. He's building up. Yeah, yeah. He's building up. He writes, Here, regrettably, I feel bound to reiterate that we've had enough of immorality and the mockery of ethics, goodness, faith and honesty. It is time to acknowledge that light-hearted superficiality has done us no good. Once the foundations of social life are corroded, what ensues are battles over conflicting interests. Let us return to promoting the good. What good? Common good. Common good. For ourselves and for the whole human family and thus advance together towards an authentic and integral growth. Every society needs to ensure that values are passed on. Otherwise, what is handed down are selfishness, violence, corruption in its various forms, indifferent and ultimately a life close to transcendence and entrenched in individual interests. Individuality must go. go. We need common values, yeah. common good. It's like you said in the previous episode, the free... Uh, um, Freedom of religion is just as long as it coincides with the common, common good. good. Absolutely. And if we do not understand this, this buttery language mm. in which it is written will confuse people. If you don't understand the agenda behind papal thinking, you will miss the point of what he is writing. When we speak of the need to care for our common home, our planet, we appeal to that spark of universal consciousness and mutual concern that may still be present in people's hearts. That's common good. Yeah. 
and universal consciences sounds almost a little bit new age. It's, it's very new age. It's very new age indeed. The spark of universal consciousness. Those who enjoy a surplus of water yet choose to conserve it for the sake of the greater human family have attained a moral stature that allows them to look beyond themselves and the group to which they belong. How marvelously human! The same attitude is demanded if we are to recognize the rights of all people, even those born beyond our borders. Again, this is humanism. Mm. God is left out of the picture. Yeah. And the morality that leads you to do something good comes from, from within humanity, yeah. which is New Age thinking. Exactly. And not, this not is very, uh, new age, yeah. very New Age indeed, not biblical at all. The common destination of created goods. Now it gets interesting. This led them to realize that if one person lacks what is necessary to live with dignity, it because another person is detaining it. This is a very interesting way of thinking. So if you have something and another person doesn't have, you are at fault because you have. Mm. Not the other person because he doesn't bother to attain it. Well, there are some that can't attain it and they have to be taken care of, true. But this is typical social doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. St. John Chrysostom summarizes it in this way. Not to share our wealth with the poor is to rob them and take away their livelihood. In other words, if you own something, you are a, a thief. Mm -hmm. The riches we possess are not our own, but theirs as well. In the words of St. Gregory the Great, when we provide the needy with their basic needs, we are giving them what belongs to them, not to us. Mm. No. This is not biblical thinking. No. If you provide the needy with the means to be able to take care of themselves, if you educate people, if you give them incentives mm. to work and to attain, then they don't have to find the riches in someone else's house. Mm. This is a reflection of rerum navarum. We will talk about that in a moment. Mm. This is Catholic social thinking at its best, or in my opinion, at its worst. Now he quotes John Paul II. Well, there's a shrine mm -hmm. in the United States to him. And Donald Trump visited that shrine. I wonder whether he's so happy with the theology of Pope John Paul. Well, he mentioned in the previous episode in that video that, that he actually it, is. Yeah, that is very strange. For my part, I would observe that the Christian tradition has never recognized the right to private property as absolute or inviolable. Okay. This is Catholic social doctrine. We will go into that and has stressed the social purpose of all forms of private property. In Roman Catholic thinking, you are allowed to possess property, but the property is not your own. It is there for social advancement. Uh, if you take it to an extreme case, like they do in some countries in the world, mm. if you own a piece of land and others have need of it, they may occupy it. Yeah. It's your social duty then to provide it because you possess it. It's probably also your social duty to continue paying the dues on the land. Mm -hmm. Now, this gets very interesting. So it says, the common use of created goods is the first principle of the whole ethical and social order. Now, this is very fascinating. So if you own something, yeah. you only own it for the social good. I once worked for an institution that gave me a cell phone because we needed to communicate it. But the cell phone was a social grant. Mm -hmm. So anyone else who stopped you and needed the, the cell phone, you had to give it to them. But the bill came to you. To you. That's interesting. You very. Yeah. So nothing you own is actually yours. If you drive, drive nothing a car... You then it's somebody is not your car. If someone has need of it, he can take it. Mm. 
It is natural and inherent right that takes priority over others. All other rights having to do with the goods necessary for the integral fulfillment of persons, including that of private property or any other type of property, should, in the words of St. Paul the VI, in no way hinder this right, but should actively facilitate its implementation. You don't own anything. He's referring to the encyclicals of Pope John Paul II. He's referring to the encyclicals of Paul VI. We'll have to have a quick look mm. at those. In no way hinder this right, but should actively facilitate its implementation. The right to private property can only be considered a secondary natural right derived from the principle of the universal destination of created goods. This has concrete consequences that ought to be reflected in the workings of society. Yet it often happens that secondary rights displace primary and overriding rights in practice, making them irrelevant. So you, you, you're using your property for your own, but it's a bad thing. It's a, it's, that's, that's a no-no in Catholic thinking. Now, in, in the Middle Ages, they had the clergy, mm -hmm. and then they had the elite. The, the elite were the landowners, and the serfs occupied the land, but they didn't own the land. So we're going to head for a similar system under this order. So a major company will provide the housing and you become basically a slave to the company. Mm -hmm. That the company then takes the place of the elite landowners of ancient times, the nobles. Yeah. So we have the same system, system. Rights without borders. No one then can remain excluded because of his or her place of birth much less because of privileges enjoyed by others who were born in lands of greater opportunity. The limits and borders of individual states cannot stand in the way of this. So if you have become a rich nation because you are a hard-working people, then you have to give that away to the poorer people. Yeah. You have to. This is Catholic social doctrine. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to be equal. Any head that pops up above the others should be lopped off. Yeah. Development must not aim at the amassing of wealth by a few, but must ensure human rights, personal and social, economic and political, including the rights of nations and of people. So what applies to the individual applies to the nations. So capitalism, in all its forms, must disappear. Mm. The alternative is the state owns everything, mm -hmm. and that is, according to Catholicism, also not right. Mm -hmm. So we have thesis, we have antithesis. Yes. Let's put it political. Yeah. We have Trump, we have Biden. Yes. Both of them are wrong. Mm -hmm. we need Both of them are wrong. We need a synthesis. Church and state. Church and state together. You have private property, mm -hmm. but only under a social mortgage. And anything that you own is not yours. Yeah. Interesting. In the previous episode, Biden said that he lives by the social doctrine of, of the, the Roman Catholic Church. And what now, I, Bernie yes. Sanders. Yes. Bernie Sanders was boasting about the fact that he went to the Vatican and there took part in these discussions of economics. Mm. And he was boasting that his philosophy is the Catholic social philosophy. And the Americans looked at him and said, This man is extreme. Mm hmm. They haven't seen anything yet. yet. They haven't seen anything yet. What but let's continue. This is just another thing that was came coming to mind now. Amy Coney Barrett belongs to that group 
people of praise. Yes. And according to the articles, they already also have a sort of social, everything belongs to everybody, they share their Absolutely. and everything. Absolutely. So Catholic social doctrine, when that becomes the norm, we will realize where this is really leading. We'll talk about it in a moment. So the right to private property is always accompanied by the primary and prior principle of the subordination of all private property to the universal destination of earth goods and thus the right of all to their use. You have nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, is this biblical? No. No. Do we have a story in the Bible where a government who wanted to take away the land of a private landowner. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the story of Ahab yes. and Naboth's vineyard? Yeah. And Ahab wanted the vineyard. Yes. And Ahab said, I want this vineyard. Mm -hmm. And Naboth said to him, I'm sorry, this is my inheritance from whom? From God. From God. Yeah. This is my God-given right. Mm. It is not yours. Mm. Do you remember who said to him, don't worry, I'll get it for you? Jezebel. Jezebel. And Jezebel serves as a type of whom? The Roman Catholic Church. Aha, how do we know? Because if you go to the Middle Church, in the book of Revelation... Mm -hmm. There is Jezebel, who is tolerated by the church. She is dealing in purple and yes. red, the mm. colors of the Roman Catholic Church. She is the one who says, I'll get it for you. Mm. So who's mightier, the king or Jezebel? Jezebel. Jezebel. His countenance was sad, the Bible says. And Jezebel, what did she do? She, she had him murdered. Yeah, killed him. She killed him. So do you think governments can sometimes mm. sanction the killing of people who own land? Yes. Do you think it could happen? By whose instigation? The church. By Jezebel. Yeah. Roman so church. this is what we're seeing here. And it states here quite clearly that the bishops of the United States have been teaching this. As the bishops of the United States have taught, there are fundamental rights that precede any society because they flow from the dignity granted to each person as created by God. This is the common good mm. and this is natural law. Natural law. He writes, what applies to nations is true also for different regions within a country since there are two are great inequalities that often exist. So this is a universal yeah. rule, a universal law. Then he talks about debt. In many instances, debt repayments not only fails to promote development, but gravely limits and conditions it. While respecting the principles that all legitimately required debt must be repaid, the way in which many poor countries fulfill this obligation should not end up compromising their very existence mm. and growth. In actual fact, he is pleading for yes. the total abolishment of um, all debt. The United Nations, his speech he addressed, he said, please, get rid, of, get rid of all debt, especially get rid because of, all of the COVID-19 situation. Now, where did money, much of that relief money that went to the poor nations go to? Where did it go to? Did it go to the people or did it go to the pockets of the leaders? Mm -hmm. Borders and their limits, a response to the arrival of migrating persons can be summarized with, by four words. Welcome, protect, promote, integrate. Same story. I'm not against migration. Mm. But if it is a migration in order to rob those who have mm -hmm. and appropriate it for yourself as a right, then that is called in the Bible stealing. Yes, theft. It's against the commandments of God. This whole encyclical is against the, the commandments. commandments of God. But it's being praised. 
because it's got such buttery language of love and kindness. And it's under the garb of love your neighbor. Absolutely. But it's a distortion of love your neighbor. Mm. The arrival of those who are different coming from other ways of life and culture can be a gift. For the stories of migrants are always stories of an encounter between individuals and between cultures. There's nothing wrong with migration. Mm. Nothing wrong with it at all. But when you migrate in order to, to, take. to take, then you have a problem. Here he speaks about Latino culture that can uh, you know, ferment the values and possibilities that can enrich the United States. That's all fair enough. But the agenda behind the agenda is to mix the religions. Yes to bring in more Catholics so that the Catholic vote will swing the thinking. He said it should be kept in mind that an innate tension exists between globalization and localization. We need to pay attention to the global so as to avoid the narrowness and banality. He's pushing for the global agenda. This is the papal agenda. A universal horizon. There's a kind of local narcissism unrelated to a healthy love of one's own people and culture. It is born of a certain insecurity and fear of the others that leads to rejection and the desire to erect walls for self-offense. <laughs> so it is becoming a criminal offense to have a particular culture. So if you are a German and you have a German culture, that has to disappear. If it's not for the common good, it has to it. go. Yeah. It has to go. So very interesting encyclical. In fact, a healthy openness never threatens one's own identity. But what if the people threaten those that are living in the country? And then he asks in chapter 5 for a better kind of politics. The development of a global community of fraternity based on the practice of social friendship on the part of peoples and nations calls for a better kind of politics, one truly of the service of the common good. Sadly, politics today often takes the forms that hinder progress towards a different world. We are heading for a new world order. And when the kings of the world give their power unto this beast, mm. they will find out what the purposes of Rome really were. And it will be too late. Yes. I find it interesting that he refers to the crisis 2007-2008 mm. provided an opportunity to develop a new economy Let's just think about that new economy. Mm -hmm. What was this new economy? What happened there? Well, the whole uh, world was in debt and f felt, uh, and they had to bail everybody out. So who bailed out who? The govern governments bailed out industry. With billions of dollars, right? Mm. Okay. Did the government have the money? No. So how do you bail out someone if you don't have the money to bail them out with? So they created the money, right? Yes, they and they printed, bailed them out. They printed money. Okay, now let's just, let's just think about this and let the listeners contemplate this issue. It's a very interesting issue. Prior to the 2007-2008 crisis, mm -hmm. there was private property and there was the government. Private industry and the government. Mm -hmm. This was the first move to get rid of this individuality. So when the governments bailed out the industry, was it in the form of a loan or was it in the form of a buy-in? A buy-in. Aha. Yes. So the loans didn't have to be repaid. Yes. So now what happened post-2007, 2008, is that government and industry became partners. Mm -hmm. Why was it necessary that they become partners? So that the community would not suffer, Right. Otherwise, everything would have collapsed. The community would have suffered. So government and industry in partnership with 
each other for the sake of community. Yeah. That's the definition of fascism. Yeah. That's the fascist system of government. And that is the government system that Rome wants. So the first step to achieving mm -hmm. this world global economic order was the 2007-2008 economic crash. Because it brought in a form of universal fascism, yeah. economically speaking. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about yeah. the trimmings of fascism. That's something else. Very fascinating. So it was to develop a new economy. Now we'll deal with that in a moment. I would also insist that to give to each his own, to cite the classic definition of justice, means that no human individual or group can consider itself absolute. No group. Mm -hmm. entitled to bypass the dignity and the rights of other individuals of their social groupings. So you can't be, have your own identity. You may not. No. Now what if you are a religious identity mm -hmm. that is different from the rest? You'll have to, You'll have to change. Mm -hmm. You'll have to change. The effective distribution of power, especially political, economic, defense-related and technological power amongst the plurality of subjects, and the creation of a judicial system for regulating claims and interests are one concrete way of limiting power. Very interesting. So you're not allowed to be an individual. I would also note the need for a reform of the United Nations organization. Yeah. He's a very busy man. <laughs> And likewise of economic institutions and international finance so that the concept of the family of nations can acquire real teeth. teeth. Yeah. We're heading somewhere. Yeah, yeah. We're heading somewhere. Courage and generosity are needed in order freely to establish shared goals and to ensure a worldwide observance of essential norms. What does that mean? I wonder whether Catholic morality and Catholic worship of the sun god mm -hmm. are included in the essential this norm. essential norm. It did say so in Laudato Si, yeah. to which he referred to many, many times. And it seems as if your individual or group mm -hmm. identity will have to give way yeah. to this new norm. Much need to change through fundamental reform and major renewal, only healthy politics involving the most diverse sectors and skills is capable of overseeing this process. I wonder whether he is setting himself up as the master mm -hmm. puppet man. The moral leader. The moral leader of the world. We need political love in order to do this. Now let's get to the nitty-gritty. At a time when various forms of fundamentalist intolerance are damaging relationship between individuals, groups and peoples. Any idea who he could be talking about? <laughs> Let us be committed to living and teaching the values of respect for each other, a love capable of welcoming differences and the priority of the dignity of every human being over his and hers ideas, opinions, practices, and even sins. Even as forms of fanaticism, close-mindedness, social and cultural fragmentation proliferate in present-day society, a good politician will take the first step and insist that different voices be heard. Disagreements may well give rise to conflicts, but uniformity proves stifling and leads to cultural decay. May we not be content with being enclosed in one fragment of reality. So if you have a particular religious norm, mm -hmm. you better uh, shape up yeah. or ship out. Yes. In this regard, the grand imam and I have called upon the architects of the international policy and the world economy to work strenuously to spread the culture of tolerance and living together in peace. And it sounds the, very good. Yeah, the two major religions he's talking about. He's talking about the two major religions. When one part of society exploits all that the world has to offer, 
acting as if the poor did not exist, there will eventually be consequences. Sooner or later, ignoring the existence and rights of others will erupt in some forms of violence, often when least expected. Now, my brother, did you create the poverty in this world? No. Did you come to the world, this world, very rich, or did you come to this world like everyone else? Everyone else. Did you have to work to achieve whatever you have achieved in life? Mm -hmm. Is it your fault if governments or systems suppress others? No. This is a very one-sided view of the world. So, let's continue. I find it interesting that he says, truth, in fact, is an inseparable companion of justice and mercy, which is, of course, true. Mm -hmm. But whose truth is he talking about? The church. Not about the truth of the Bible. No. At the cross, justice and mercy kissed each mm. other. That's where you find truth. Truth is found in Jesus Christ and in his word and in his law. This is absolutely counter to everything yeah. that the Bible stands for. Well, I must just say, the Roman church. Yeah. But Not just church. Correct, correct. That's what we're talking about. And he refers to the bishops of South Africa. He's, he's bringing in the whole world in an integrated form. In point 275 he says, it should be acknowledged that amongst the most important causes of the crisis of the modern world are a desensitized human conscience, a distancing from religious values and the prevailing individualism. Accompanied by materialistic philosophies that deify the human person and introduce worldly and material values in place of supreme and transcendental principles. It's interesting that human conscience has been desensitized by whom? Isn't that by the media? Yeah. Do you think Hollywood played a part? Yes. So Jesuit theater played a part in this? Mm -hmm. So you create the crisis, you create the chaos, and then out of the chaos, you create your new order. world, order, ordo, ab, cao. Very interesting. Individualism has to go. And it's um, linked to religious values. Religi Who's so religious values? The Roman Church. The Roman Church. But if I'm also reading this right, it says you're not you're prevailing, prevailing individualism. Yes. So you're not allowed to have your individual religion. No. 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 You, have to, you have to serve the common good. Mm. Freedom of religion is only valid as long as it serves the common good. And who determines the common good? The Roman Catholic Church. That's why it says here, room needs to be made for reflection born of religious traditions. In vain you worship me, teaching the for doctrine the commandments of men. Yes. You have made void the law by your traditions. They are the repository of centuries of experience and wisdom. Here again he places tradition above the word of God. This is a very dangerous encyclical. For these reasons the church while respecting the autonomy of political life, does not restrict her mission to the private sphere. Church and state. Church and state together. On the contrary, she cannot and must not remain on the sidelines in the building of a better world or fail to reawaken the spiritual energy that contribute to the betterment of society. It is true that religious ministers must not engage in the party politics that are the proper domain of the laity, but neither can they renounce the political dimension of life itself. The church will dictate. And they make the distinction between laity and hierarchy. Yeah. Again, that's unbiblical too. And William Barr said the same. Exactly. And he constantly says... It involves constant attention to the common good and a concern for integral human development. This 
encyclical sets the stage mm. for what is coming upon the world. We don't have to read it all, but it's interesting. The church has a public role over and above her charitable and educational activities. She works for the advancement of humanity and of universal fraternity. This is the issue. She does not claim to compete with earthly powers, but to offer herself as a family amongst families. This is the church open to bearing witness in today's world, open to faith and hope and love for the Lord and for those whom he loves with a preferential love, a home with open doors. The church is a home with open doors because she is a mother. She is the mother of all the churches. She is the great whore of Babylon. Upon her forehead is written mystery, yeah. Babylon the great. And then he introduces paganism by saying, for many Christians, this journey of fraternity also has a mother whose name is Mary. Having received this universal motherhood at the foot of the cross, she cares not only for Jesus, but also for the rest of her children. Now, Fatima promised that the whole world would be at the feet of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, let's say Mary at Fatima. Mm. It's interesting that they called it Fatima, and it brings, of course, the Muslim world oh. into union with the Catholic world. But be that as it may, I think we've read enough of this encyclical to get the point. Yes. I want to point the viewers to this book, Ecclesiastical Megalomania, by John Robbins. It's a very fascinating book, and if you want to know more about Catholic social doctrine, and the economic principles of the Roman Catholic Church, then you would be wise to read this book. I just want to read one or two statements here which might interest you. He quotes here, Monsieur John Ryan, the Roman Catholic architect of the New Deal, and of course that was a Jesuit, and it says, But constitutions can be changed, and non-Catholic sects may decline to such a point that the political proscription of them may become feasible and expedient. What protection would they have then against the Catholic state? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. The latter could logically tolerate only such religious activities as were confined to members of the dissenting groups. It could not permit them to carry on general propaganda, nor accord their organizations certain privileges that had frequently be extended to all religious corporations. For example, exemption from taxation as an example. The church will rule. In 1948, the Jesuit Cavalli explained Roman Catholic state political strategy in La Savita Cattolica. It says the Roman Catholic Church, convinced through its divine prerogatives of being the only true church, must demand the right of freedom for herself alone. Because such a right can only be possessed by truth, never by error. In a state where the majority of the people are Catholic, the Church will require that legal existence be denied to error, and that if religious minorities actively exist, they shall have only a de facto existence without opportunity to spread their beliefs. Sure. This is Jesuit thinking. If you belong to some group that believes the Bible, that believes that Jesus is the only way to salvation, that believes that the Word of God is the norm and standard for your life, that believes that the law of God in its entirety, all ten commandments is binding, you will be an anathema in the eyes of this church. Ayn Rand was right when she wrote in 1967, 
The Catholic Church has never given up the hope to re-establish the medieval union of church and state with a global state and a global theocracy as its ultimate goal. He writes further, the Roman church state in the 20th century, however, is an institution recovering from a mortal wound. This is biblical language from an economist. If and when it regains in full power and authority, it will impose a regime more sinister than any the planet has yet seen. And if people still do not believe us, mm -hmm. let us just go through a few papal statements to show that this encyclical is absolutely in harmony with papal thinking and has nothing to do with fraternity and brotherly love. It has to do with megalomania and power hunger. I find it very interesting, my young brother, that Archbishop Quigley in 1903 in the Chicago Tribune wrote the following, when the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. <laughs> And that is why the battlefield is in the United States of America. And the ideology which will eventually surface there. When this thesis and this antithesis, let's say Biden and Trump, yeah. clash, will produce the synthesis that has been prepared and already implemented since the 2002 seven and 2008 economic crash. Mm. But let us just go to some statements. I just want to say on that, that it's also biblical language. The image of the beast will give all its power to the beast. Absolutely. According to canon law, the control of all property of the Roman church state belongs to the Pope, its supreme emperor. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. That's These are statements. This comes from Thomas Rees, Inside the Vatican, The Politics and Organization of the Catholic Church, Harvard University Press. The Economic Thought of the Roman Catholic Church. Private Property. Thomas Aquinas wrote no treatise on economics, but his thinking based on that of Aristotle, very interesting, mm -hmm. not based upon the Bible, Great. just like Francis, is foundational for understanding the economic thought of the Roman church state. This is the growth of economic thought by Henry Siegel. Roman Catholic economic thought as developed by the popes in their encyclicals and by Roman church state councils has been a contributor to feudalism and guild socialism in Europe during the Middle Ages. Fascism in Italy, Spain, Portugal, Croatia, and Latin America in the 20th century. Nazism in Germany in the 20th century. Interventionism and redistributive state in the West, including the United States in the 20th century. Liberation theology in Latin America and Africa in the 20th century. And now we're heading for the climax. Yeah. Thomas Aquinas discussing private property. The possession of all things in common is the natural law. Thomas wrote, the possession of all things in common and universal freedom are said to be of the natural law because to wit the distinction of possessions and slavery were not brought in by nature but devised by human reason for the benefit of human life. Let's see how he continues. The community of goods wrote Thomas, is ascribed to natural law. Not that natural law dictates that all things should be possessed in common and that nothing should be possessed as one's own, but because the division of possession is not according to natural law, but rather arose from the human agreement which belongs to positive law, hence the ownership of possession is not contrary to the natural law, but in addition thereto devised by human reason. They always write in this way. They write in this way to this very day. Exactly. This is, it, it actually so that the sounds, common person shouldn't understand yeah. what they are saying. But it's actually sounding as if you're just continuing 
continuing reading the, the Bob's encyclical. encyclical. Absolutely. He writes, Hence, what certain people have in superabundance is due by natural law to the purpose of succoring the poor. Did we just read that? Yep. Exactly we, just wrote that we just read that in the encyclical. Okay. He writes further, because the goods of some are due to others by natural law. The goods of some are due to others. <laughs> There's no sin if the poor take the goods of their neighbors. <laughs> okay. So in other words, you can break the commandments of God. That's fine. I've seen my neighbor has got some nice things. Maybe I can go over because Absolutely. I consider myself poor. In cases of need, all things are common property, so that there would seem to be no sin in taking another's property for need has made it common. Mm. So who determines the need, my young brother? Well, according to this, you, you yourself. You determine yeah. it. And the church will help you mm -hmm. to determine it, right? Yeah. Not only is such taking of another's property not a sin, it is not even a crime, according to Thomas. It is lawful for a man to succor his own need by means of another's property, by taking it either openly or secretly. Nor is this properly speaking theft and robbery. It is not theft, properly speaking, to take secretly and use another's property in a case of extreme need, because that which he takes for the support of his life becomes his own property by reason of this need. And a case of like need, a man may also take secretly another's property in order to succor his neighbor in need. Now in the United States and in many countries around the mm. world, we've had riots and looting. Mm. And 99% of the time, the looters get away scot-free and the owners are sitting crying because their goods have been redistributed yeah. without consequence. So... <laughs> You don't have to question anymore why that happens that when people take something of somebody else, yes, nothing happens. And to why them. you should actually defund the police, mm. get rid of them because everything is common. You have no right to have something in superabundance. Now, if you have a store full of things, that's really a superabundance. How yeah. about just looting the store? Yeah, that's fine, no consequence. The church says it's not a sin. The Roman Catholic doctrine of private property is echoed in the 19th century communist slogan from each according to his ability to each according to his need. So human rights are more important than property rights. It was the creed of Lyndon Johnson's great society we shall take from the haves and give to the have-nots who need it so much. It appears in the literature of fascism, Nazism, liberation theology, interventionism, and socialism. This is what the Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. people and all of them are all about. This yep. is Roman Catholic doctrine. Now John Paul II, who is such a hero in the United States at the moment, mm. expression of his 1987 encyclical on social concern. It is necessary to state once more the characteristic principle of Christian social doctrine. The goods of this world are originally meant for all. The right of private property is valid and necessary, but it does not nullify the value of this principle. Private property, in fact, is under a social mortgage. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to everyone. Which means that it has an intrinsically social function based upon and justified precisely by the principle of the universal destination of goods. So who owns everything? The church. And nobody else owns anything, not even governments. No. The church owns um, everything. everything. If you go back in history and you go to the map of South America where the Pope took his finger and said, this belongs now to my good country, Portugal. This here belongs to my good country, Spain. If you do not toe the line, I'll take it away from you and give it to someone else. Mm. He'll put his hand over Czechoslovakia and say, well, the Czech Republic, and say, this no longer exists because a Jan Hus dared to sway the populace away from Rome. 
that country, that economy won't exist. Pope Paul VI, did uh, Francis just quote him? Yes. Each man has therefore the right to find in the world what is necessary for himself. The recent council, Vatican II, reminds us of this. God intended the earth and all that it contains for the use of every human being and people. Thus, as all men follow justice and unite in charity, created goods should abound for them on a reasonable basis. All other rights whatsoever, including those of property and of free commerce, are to be subordinate to this principle. You don't own anything. Yeah. And just on the previous one with John Paul II, um, it looks like maybe Trump is now against all this the property and everything belonging to everybody. But like you said, he endorses John, the Paul, the John Paul II. Absolutely. Absolutely. And here he quotes, If one is in extreme necessity, has the right to procure for himself what he needs out of the riches of others. That's exactly what Thomas Aquinas said. Mm. These people are not saints. They're criminals in the eyes of God. And we label them, or the church labels them saint. Mm. Therefore, because private property is immoral, all men, individual and governments have the moral obligation to redistribute goods held unjustly by property owners. Sure. Interesting, right? <laughs> John Paul II says, all goods includes not just goods found in nature, but manufactured goods as well. So you don't have a right to your TV if someone else has need of it. <laughs> <laughs> or your motor vehicle. Nothing. Hijacking. Everything is permissible. No wonder society is in the state that it is in. They have made void God's law. This system is called by God lawlessness. Mm. The man of sin, the man of lawlessness. Mm. This is what he is. He makes void the law of God and sets himself up as the moral value system of the world in the name of the very one who, is you, who he is usurping of his power. Yeah, Jesus. Absolutely. I get very passionate yeah, about this. And I would just also again like to reiterate. Don't think, yeah, but this is the Pope and this is the Roman Catholic Church. It's just nothing. You just heard in the previous episode, Biden and Trump uplift this institution. Yes, and not only that. The groundwork for the implementation, implementation of these things has already been done. Yeah. So this is not a philosophy somewhere on the yeah. horizon. This is at the door. And this encyclical that you've just been uh, going through acknowledges also that, that Rome has not changed. Rome has not changed one iota. And this encyclical by Pope Pius Rerum Novarum on the condition of the working classes, one of the Roman Church's most influential statements on the economic matters is the 1891 encyclical Rerum Novarum on the condition of the working classes. Nothing has changed. Mm. This encyclical comes from 1891. And Every pope has quoted it. In this encyclical, the Roman Church state allies itself with the Proteliorat, with, which in Marxism is the great and final enemy of the capitalist order. Pius, writing in 1931, declared that the Rerum Novarum stood out in this, that it laid down for all mankind unerring rules for the right solutions of the difficult problems of human solidarity called the social question. This is Pius writing in Quadragesimo Anno. John the Twenty-Third wrote, and he quoted the Rerum Novarum, and this is the Pope that started Vatican II, remember. By far the most notable evidence of this social teaching and action which the Church has set forth through the century undoubtedly is the very distinguished encyclical letter Rerum Novarum. I want to say to you today that the encyclical which Pope Francis has just released mm. 
couched in this buttery, flowery language is nothing other than a rehash of Rerum Novarum. Issued 70 years ago, the norms and recommendations contained therein were so momentous that their memory will never fall into oblivion. And Pope Francis has just made pretty sure of that. He told us that the encyclical Rerum Novarum was instrumental in ending laissez-faire capitalism in the 20th century by ushering in the era of effective interference by government. You have no privacy. And haven't they taken that to a new level, that they've taken away your privacy? No. Yes. With it's in your pocket every single day when you carry your phone with you. Yes, and now with the COVID-19, look at the surveillance. Absolutely. There's no privacy. Anymore. No privacy. This is from the book Ecclesiastical Megalomania that I'm quoting now. He says, Rerum Novarum was the voice of moral authority needed to ensure the development of effective interference by all governments in the 20th century. Pius the 11th wrote, It is not surprising, therefore, that under the teachings and guidings of the church, many learned priests and laymen earnestly devoted themselves to the problem of elaborating social and economic science in accordance with the conditions of our age. So who fomented the violence in the world? The church. Yeah. And now they use the violence to implement their system. Under the guidance and in the light of Leo's encyclical Rerum Novarum, that's almost 130 years ago, yeah was thus evolved a truly Christian social science which continues to be fostered and enriched daily by the tireless labors of those picked men whom we have named the auxiliaries of the church. I wonder who these picked men were. Is it the men running the politics of the world? Yep, 330 years already. And who constantly is standing by their side? Their Jesuit guides and relates. Yep. Nor were these the only blessings which followed from the encyclical. The doctrine of Rerum Novarum began little by little to penetrate amongst those who being outside Catholic unity do not recognize the authority of the church. The kings of the world will give their power unto the church, unto the Roman Catholic system and it's going to happen. Mm. And these Catholic principles of sociology gradually became part of the intellectual heritage of the whole human race. Thus too we rejoice that the Catholic truths proclaimed so vigorously by our illustrious predecessor Leo XIII are advanced and advocated not merely in non-Catholic books and journals, but frequently also in legislative assemblies and in the courts of justice. The Bidens of this world, the Bernie Sanders of yeah. this world, they are speaking this language. Those picked men, fascinating language, yes. secret societies, mm. conspiracy theories. Our friends will have a field day about conspiracy theories. So, John Robbins sums it up and he asks the question, who are those picked men? Mm. He says, those picked men, we have named the auxiliaries of the church, quoting what the Pope had said, yeah. who have been so instrumental in entering the free enterprise system of the 19th century and substituting a system of effective interference in government in the 20th century, who those picked men are, I do not know. Well, I think we are watching those picked men speaking on our television screens mm -hmm. every day. Yes. Pius wrote in his encyclical, under fascism, property owners may keep their property, titles and deed, but the use of their property, as Leo the Thirteenth wrote, common. is common. Mm. This is exactly what Pope Francis said. Fascism is a form of socialism that retains the forms and trappings of capitalism 
but not its substance. Under fascism, property titles and deeds are intact, but the institution of private property has disappeared. You appear to own the land. You appear to be on your own vineyard. But Ahab says, I want it. Mm -hmm. And Jezebel says, I'll, get I'll it give you. it to you. And if he doesn't want to move, I'll kill him. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting scenario. Government regulations and mandates have replaced it. For this distinction between legal ownership and actual use, the fascists owe a debt to the Roman church state. That's out of the mouth of the Roman Catholic system. When we speak of the reform of institution, the state comes chiefly to mind. Not as if universal well-being were to be expected from its activity, but because things have come to such a pass through the evil of what we have known termed individualism, that following upon the overthrow and near extinction of that rich social life which was once highly developed through associations of various kinds, the social policy of the state therefore must devote itself to the re-establishment of the industries and professions. Let's put that in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. We want to go back to the Middle Ages. That's what it says. And it talks about the extinction of that rich social life which history termed the Dark Ages. This is where we're heading, yeah. but worse. The experiment with economic freedom, Pius XI wrote, must end, and economic life must again be subjected to the planning and government. So now having discussed the latest encyclical of the Pope, which comes after Laudato Si, mm -hmm where we have the care of the environment and the introduction of the concept of rest as determined by the Roman Catholic Church, mm -hmm. we now add the fraternity and the social structure. Then you have the moral directive and you have the social directive and it's the dictates of the Roman Catholic yes. Church. May God give us wisdom as we come to this system, which, and I want to end with repeating the statement that we read in John Robbins, mm. where the author states what we've read already. The Roman church state in the 20th century, let's make that the 21st century, however, is an institution recovering from a mortal wound. If and when it regains its full power and authority, it will impose a regime more sinister than any the planet has yet seen. This is on page 195 of this book. May God grant humanity mercy and may they find refuge under the wing of Jesus Christ so that they may understand what true liberty is all mm. about. It is bound up in his law. Yes. It is bound up in his law, which is a transcript of the character of God and grants you rights which they, with impunity, will remove from you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are heading for the very final moments of Earth's history. We are in very serious times. And there is only one solution that is left. Because I know, Lord, that the kings of the world will give their power unto this beast. And the solution is the rock cut out without human hands that will strike the statue and bring the systems to an end so that not even the dust will remain. May that day come soon, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here.
Thank you.